welcome back to the What The Folk Sunderland Preview Podcast. Four points over the Easter period have injected some last-minute hope that Sunderland can still somehow make the playoffs with five games to go. Um, a win this coming Saturday would definitely strengthen those claims, but an informed Birmingham City side do stand in our way at the stadium like this Saturday. And to give us a lowdown on what we are likely to face this week and what we're likely to see is Tommy from Birmingham City Podcast and Fanzine Blues Focus. Tommy, how are you doing, mate? You all right? I'm good, man. Thanks. How are you? Uh, yeah, it's kind of that point in the season where, like I said before, this is hope. Ultimately, mm. I know the season is pretty much over. Um, five games to go. You're in 17th, nine points to the relegation zone. Is your season over? I think so, yeah. I think um, the bottom three could be decided within the next two games and I feel like nine points clear. We're looking pretty safe at this point. We only need a couple more wins to really be mathematically safe anyway. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that we are going to survive and these last few games, they might be a bit boring. The one we had against Stoke was uh, very boring, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I feel like the season's pretty much finished now and um, I, I, I do think that um, probably Reading are probably for the chop now since they've sacked Paul Lintz as well. Funny, I said the other day about the season being dead and how games are likely to be boring, and then we drew 4 4 with Hull. So you never yeah. know. You never know. Um, it's a funny one for Birmingham fans because we'll get into it a little bit further into to why I think that. But, you know, we're coming five games from the end. Like you say, 17th, nine points clear. You're going to be fine. I'd be really surprised if you're not. Um, but how has the season as a whole been viewed by, by Birmingham fans? I think the majority of it has been actually okay considering where we were before the start of the season I think a lot of people probably me as well thinking that we were going to go down we weren't signing players We've just gotten rid of the manager we pointed um, John Eustace who had never been a championship manager before it just felt like we were trying to you know not go down like in the absolutely catastrophic catastrophic way um, but I feel like we've done really well to be in the position we are it's not great considering the club we are and the fan base we've got, of course. Um, and we've had this similar season for the last seven seasons, I want to say now, um, where we've finished below 17th. Um, but it's been OK. We've had some really good games this season. We had a great result against some of the top teams like Burnley. We drew with them. We drew with Watford. We only just lost to Norwich at the start of the season. So we were battling hard and the games were exciting and everything. Um, but I feel like after the World Cup period, we sort of, I don't know. I think the seasoning of some of the players has really shown, really. It's the fact that they probably aren't up to scratch for the whole season. They can do spurts here and there. And we went on a terrible run of form. I think we lost five in a row and only won the next game and only won that game against Swansea in the last minute, which was absolutely chaotic. Uh, it was the 97th minute that was um, to win that game. But yeah, it, it's been up and down. It's been uh, very much a roller coaster. We've had some incredibly exciting games this season. We've had some very boring games this season like Stoke just gone by and also Millwall at home this season that was another incredibly boring (laughs) nil-nil um but yeah it's not been terrible that's one thing it's not been it's not been like I said uh, catastrophe for us really I think you touched on it before there but they're like prior to the season I remember us coming up and people were saying look the very least, I think you'll stay up you could be dark horses you'll stay up because Redden and Birmingham are not in the best financial shape and some people have said to me, they're certain to go down. It was mostly red, and I'll be honest. But people were like, Birmingham will go down. They'll be the next Derby County. That's who this is going to be. Mm-hmm. So prior to the season, I'll be honest, Birmingham were the team that everyone told me were, were going to be with red and the ones that were in the bottom three in some, some way, shape, size, or form. It hasn't really worked out like that at any point. I've never felt like Birmingham were ever, ever ne- necessarily in that much trouble. But what were the fans' expectations? Because I suppose even if everyone else outside the, the club saying, oof, could go down, you might have some worries. But you're never going to a season saying, well, I think we're going to get relegated. What were the kind of maximum and, and maybe minimum expectations of what you could do this season before the before the campaign began? Oh, I don't know. It's hard because obviously at the time... Um... I think we were just sort of, I don't know, it's, it's like the word apathy I use quite a lot at the moment, just because the, the way we've been in the season for so long and for how many seasons it's been now, we've just sort of gotten used to this level of football almost, which is really disappointing, really. Um, but I don't really remember what people's general feel around the club were before the season started. I think the majority were thinking that we were going to be in a relegation battle, um, which technically we are, but it doesn't feel like it. Um 
But I feel like the majority of the people were definitely thinking that. I don't think anybody was thinking playoffs, even though we were slightly pushing towards it in like October to November times. And we possibly could have gone uh, into sixth had we not lost to use at, uh, at home when we lost 2-1. I mean, if anything's to go on by that game, probably then I can expect another game like that on Saturday, really. But yeah, to answer your question, I think the majority of the people were thinking a relegation battle. But whether people were thinking we were going to survive or go down, I think that was varied with certain people's pessimistic or optimistic opinions. And with, with John Eustace, look, he, I know he had some experience beforehand, but at the level he's been given the job at, I don't really think he was, I don't want to say an uninspired um, an inspired or uninspired kind of appointment, but he was a risk at the very least. He seems to have done quite well. There's a lot of people obviously have rated him quite highly. The job he's done because of the circumstances he's had, I think, especially people my age will remember him as a, a player at Coventry and whatnot previously. But has he offered a little bit of hope for the future? Because sometimes even in the most dire financial or most apathetic of situations, having a manager that you can believe in is kind of a a big thing to kind of put your, put your support into. I think he's done well in keeping the changing room together. You know, he's kept the players well. He's on side with people like Deeney and everything. He's good friends with them. They know each other from Watford days. Um as well as the fact that he has done some pretty decent football in the time this season. But I don't know, it's your first championship job. So at times this season, he has gone safe and put a five at the back and tried to not shut up shop. I remember we went to Watford after we just won the week before. And I was kind of hoping we'd go on the attack and you know take it to Watford because I didn't think of much of them defensively. But we didn't. And we sat back for the 90 minutes and we really should have, you know, for the journey that we had as well, I think he probably really could have considered May maybe giving it a go because either outcome we were probably going to lose anyway. But I feel like um, it's a learning curve for him either way. You know, he's um, a young manager. He's um, like you said, never been a championship manager before. He was the assistant with Mark Warburton at QPR. Uh, I did a decent job with him. Um, but I feel like he's done well. You know, but I I do think we could do better for the manager that we possibly could attract. I feel like. Um, by the way, that Watford do sack managers, we could get Chris Wilder in for next season. <laughs> you could have you could have any Watford manager within sort of three <laughs> games, I think, couldn't you? Um, it's an interesting one, Birmingham, because when you look to League One, there was more and more big clubs that were coming in, but when we were in League One, the championship really quite similar. Um, and Birmingham are definitely within that realm of big clubs. I mean, most of my lifetime, I'd say Birmingham's been either fighting for promotion from this division or in the division above. Mm. Um, they're obviously a huge football club um, alongside, you know, the other club in the Midlands, which I won't mention. But <laughs> as you said before, you're not really punching above your weight. You're probably below the expectation and below where you historically have been. There's reasons for that. But how does the fan base like align? Because we had it ourselves, like we were in League One and, you know, we knew where we were at. But we knew where we should be. Oh, brilliant. That's my doorbell. Fantastic. Um, but we knew where we should be. However, you know, we had to align expectations a little bit of where we were. What are Birmingham mm. fans like in terms of aligning those expectations with the historical placement and where you've been in the league? Is that hard? Yeah, it is. It really is, actually. I think a lot of people have... Because obviously, during the 80s, we were not a very good side at all, really. And in the 90s, we were in the third division, which obviously is League One now. Um, so I think they're used to that. I don't think that we're used to this as a fan base being in the same position pretty much every single season from 17th to 21st. We haven't finished, if I remember rightly, I think it's since 2017 we haven't finished above 17th, which is a long time. I mean, 2017 feels like yesterday for me, but you know, considering like how long it actually is now, it's a long time really. So realistically, a, a proper aim that we should be at least getting, with this team particularly, if I'm thinking it from an unbiased opinion, I'm thinking that we should at least be finishing yeah, you know, sort of mid table ish, really, like 12th or 11th. You know, we've got a better team than we've played this season. And like I said, I bring back to the point where we were um, saying that we probably don't have the best season team. We have quite a, a young and an old squad, I'd say. We've got some very talented young players in George Hall and Alfie Chang who have been performing fantastically lately, lately. And the fans have been getting on really well with them. You know, they really look forward to what they can see, obviously, with all the Jude Bellingham stuff that's come, come before with everything. I feel like. Whenever we get a new youngster, it's always like, oh, but what can he bring to us now? Um, and also we've got some of the young, older veterans as well, like Lukas Djukovic, who's been with us for probably for that length of time, actually. He's just such a war horse, really. And he's 
he's fantastic. He's a warrior. And you've also got Deeney, who the fans really like as well, because he's a Blues fan. So, I don't know. I just feel like the, the, we get along with the players at the club. I feel like they do try their hardest. But for the expectations we've currently got at the moment, it should be higher. We shouldn't be in, a, we shouldn't be in this position again. But there again, it's difficult to say. It's hard. It's not an easy division, as we all know. And I feel like we should be higher, technically. And then, obviously, the higher we finish, then we can benchmark that and move forward more in the future as well. Yeah, I can understand absolutely what you said about apathy. Uh, definitely something I thought were, was something before, mm. and it tends to be, funnily enough, when you have Groundhog Day a little bit, which is it sounds like you're going through at the moment now. People will be asking, you know, ask me about Speakman, ask me about Joe Bellingham and all this kind of stuff. I'm coming on to it, don't worry. But before I do, <laughs> another similarity that we have, there's a couple. Um, one of them really struck me at the start of the season, and maybe we actually got it a little bit easier, which is kind of a scary thing to say but Netflix documentary we don't really like touching on that too much but it, it did exist um Methven Donald especially mm. Methven incredibly I don't want to say entertaining because he wasn't for us but I think people watched it and it, we became a little bit banterish for a little while but people were watching it now at the start of the season Birmingham were a little bit that because of the madcap behavior which I'll put in an in inverted commas of of Lawrence Bassini arguing on TalkSport with Simon Jordan, saying you're going to do this, that, and the other. And just, I'm going to be blunt, talking shite. Um, now, as a fan, there's a fan base that's below that. There's a fan base that has to deal with that and, and kind of come with the jibes and see this stuff on Twitter. And that can be quite disheartening. Like, I know exactly what that's like because we had it with with Methven and, and the, the Ibiza party tunes and all that kind of rubbish and still follows us. What was that period like being a Birmingham fan when Bassini was basically making a mockery of your football club that you never mm. really intended to buy. Yeah, I think the more embarrassing thing for Bassini with us is the fact that he wasn't even our owner when he was making those jokes with those sort of things on talk sports. It's like, mate, you have no relation to us in the slightest. You haven't got the money to take over us. You've got no proper credentials of being an owner at all, aside from Watford, which you've completely pissed down the drain. And obviously, I can completely relate with all the Sunderland stuff as well with the owners and everything through that Netflix documentary. It's great to see from the outside, but like you said, there's a fan base beneath it. And everything. I just remember standing in the living room because I remember it really well, actually, because we were moving my uh, uh, moving our settee out at the same day. We're getting a new one in. And I just remember we stood up because we've got no sofa or anything in the room, so it's a completely bare room. I'm just listening to it on the radio, and I'm just like, I literally... Like cr crippling my face up so much with cringe, it was like this cannot be happening. This is the most embarrassing thing I think I've ever heard before. It was horrendous, and like <laughs> it was funny when I watched it. Like I laughed at first, and I was like, "God, what's this guy? What's this guy doing?" Um, but then, like I say, you know, when I'm when I'm writing down questions and I'm thinking about things to chat about on this podcast, mm. I'm thinking, "God, I've been there. There's a fan base under that. There's a community under all that, and there's there's people that." Are, genuinely affects and i think that's sometimes what you know the, the likes of the names we've just mentioned just there do occasionally forget thankfully as expected nothing really happened and um, <laughs> the more important and the much more fun connections are obviously uh christian speakman is obviously a, a big one for ourselves he's he's came in and i would say you know there's there's people that question certain decisions i've definitely been one of them but on the whole people have been very very happy with his recruitment a lot of the players that he's brought in and the the model which I haven't said in a few episodes, but I've said it just now, tends to work in almost most circumstances with the players that we've brought in. When we got him from Birmingham, I remember going on Twitter and it wasn't always massively complimentary. Uh, it was more complimentary towards Mike Dodds, who, funnily enough, up until recently was probably seen a little bit derided for a really poor three-game spell he had in caretaker charge, which almost mm -hmm. cost us promotion last year. But... How was that duo remembered? And, you know, and obviously you had a lot to do with um, Jude Bellingham, who's obviously a world-class player and is still about 12 years old, which is mental. Um, but how were those how were those duos remembered? Is, it, is he remembered as the guy who just brought Bellingham through or did he have more success than maybe we saw previously? Is he is he remembered well? And, and, and what are your kind of override memories of him? Well, that he is responsible for a lot of the young players who come through at the Blues. He definitely... I mean, his his um, party piece, of course, is Jude Bellingham, you know, and that's something to put on your CV. That is, but um, he really, he is probably the last of that really great Blues era we had in between two thousand and nine to twenty eleven. Really, we like obviously he wasn't impactful at that time, really, but 
he sort of came during that period. I feel like he was the last of those type of people who, when he left in, was it 2021? I can't remember when it was now. Like It was just like all the work that he'd done for us, bringing players through like Nathan Redmond, Damari Gray, Jude Bellingham, Jordan Much as well, who was a quality player when he was in the Premier League with Cardiff. Um, even helping players like Jack Butland, I imagine, when he was a young keeper at the Blues and everything as well. You know, his work that he put in at the club, I mean, I spoke to him on a podcast that we did as well. Like, it just felt like he never got the proper send off that he deserved because obviously we were in a mess financially. With all the work that he put in, it was just like, see you later, nothing. Just, I don't remember the time well at all. Apparently, it was in August of that season back from lockdown. I don't remember it, him leaving at all almost. It was like, it was only a couple of months later, did I suddenly realize that he was gone? It was like, hang about, where's this all happening in there? So he really, for the, for the coach he is as well and the person he is he's such a top guy he's such a lovely person as well and particularly Christian Speakman as well I don't know too much about him but I know that he has an incredible impact with loads of other players as well and obviously it's been shown at Sunderland as well now because since they've arrived yes that Mike Dodds isn't a manager and he was only the interim there um, but both of them as coaches they are fantastic I, I don't I can really I can't really think of two better coaches in England really they are just fantastic at their job I really appreciated all the work they did and was rather disappointed to see them leave Jack Clark Diallo you know the younger boys that have came from France have obviously yeah they've not been perfect every single game but the bulk of games have been fantastic Jack Clark's been in my opinion fantastic all season um I probably ventured away from it with the, the financial situation, but I want to come back to it a little bit before we talk about the actual football, which is mm-hmm. annoyingly getting less and less, isn't it, in these, in these <laughs> sort of shows because of the way football is. But um, things obviously weren't great at the start of the season. Bassini, we've discussed that. Um, where's Birmingham at, at the moment in terms of financial status and, and what's the current outlook for yourselves? As far as you're aware, obviously, you, you haven't seen the books, but as far as you know... <laughs> Well, surprisingly, there's been some uh, talk about uh, potential ownership change today, actually. Some news came out earlier today um, with the potential shareholders. I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know those proper terminologies. I, I, I'm i just a football fan, really, at the end of the day. So I, I can kind of give a... I can butcher a sort of an explanation towards it, but it looks like there's going to be a changeover. So that that's good to see because BSHL, our current owners, that we've been wanting out for the last four years I would say when it's been really in the limelight um, look to be finally selling up um, they've been very naive I think with a lot of the money that they've spent when they've been here because they have spent money they definitely have they spent loads of money actually when you really consider it they just haven't given it to the right people at the right time we got in Harry Redknapp in 2017 um, thinking that we were going to re- 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 re-energize the team um, inject some cash into some new signings and everything it just didn't work. We gave the wrong money to the wrong people. You know, we were looking for John Terry to sign in that summer. We then couldn't get him. We couldn't get our second choice. And we ended up with our third choice centre backs instead. So it was just that whole transfer window. It was great at the time when you've seen players coming through, but in hindsight, it was a disaster, really. And to think now we're still in the similar position we are six years later or how many other years later it is now, it's like, Time is up, and now that they've stopped investing pretty much within the club, it's more, it's even more. Why don't you just leave? And it's taken them so long to even consider it. It looks like now that they are finally considering it, but there's other reasons for it. They probably want to keep their um listing on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, which is a big thing for them, um, for whatever reason. So I'm not too sure. I can't be liable for saying anything that's illegal towards the things like that, but um. Yeah, it's it's been a mess. It really has. But hopefully in the next few years, we'll start to see the back of them because that's I imagine that's probably how long it will take. It's a business at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, Sunderland fans have been there. We understand that. Fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of other similarities that we have, obviously one player who was actually linked to us again in the summer, and I would have really liked to see him come back. Yourselves are obviously dealing with... Um, loans and free transfers because of everything we spoke about before and one of those loans that you brought in for the, the second time is Dion Sanderson obviously Indeed, yeah. massive hit for us um, at Sunderland he played right across the back four probably best at centre half but could play it right back left back in a back three in a back four um, but the time he spent with us was in was in League One which is look 
we've adapted well at the championship, but there's a definite, definite cough and call. Eh? Um, he's played 30 games for Birmingham this season. He's, he's approaching that sort of 22, 23 age when he's wanting to be playing 30 games a season. How has he been viewed by Blues fans this season on his form? And, and would you like to see him join permanently? Is he a player that the fans would prefer to see him there like full time? Yeah, definitely. We would definitely like just some permanent players in general. So to get somebody like Sanderson in would be great. Um, yeah, he's been very good alongside Austin Trusty. Um, another centre back we got in on loan this season. Um, I think they've worked well together. Unfortunately, he's still injured until um, I think it's until like the Carpentry game, right until the end of the season. Um, I think he is a bit injury prone. Actually, it's one thing that he and a lot of the other players in the team might share. Actually, but he's good. He's um, he, he's quite. He's I don't know really know how to compare him to anybody. I don't want to say that somebody like Van Dyke because then somebody in the comment section on, on Twitter would somebody would tweet at me saying like, "Why are you comparing Dion Sanderson to Virgil Van Dyke?" It's like I'm not saying it's that. I'm just comparing the likability at times. It's just anyway. Um, yeah, he's he's got that sort of edge about him though. He's he's quite calm. He's quite composed. And really, I think he's starting to really mature now. He's starting to look more strong. He's getting more athletic. And I think now, in terms of the, if he can get back on top of his injuries and make sure that he stays fit, I feel like he can really press on next season. Particularly if we sign him as well, because you know, if we if we do push on and finish in the top half next season, that's a good solid year, I reckon. And he he, he can, I reckon he can join maybe and even like a lower league Premier League team or something like that. So I think that's something that he can aim towards. We definitely felt like that about Dion when he was here, but it's, you know, sometimes hard to, to judge a league one and a 20 year old up with, with that. I remember we got Callum Doyle last season, 17 years old from Man City and for about four games, he looked like he'd be the next England captain. And then for the last six games he played, he looked like he'd play for dog and duck. If I'm completely honest, and I'm sure he'll go and have a great career. And obviously he's a young boy, but it's good to see Sanderson doing well because I do think, you know, many of us felt he'd 100% make the step up to the championship. I think when we were linked with him at the start of the season, like I say, I was quite happy with him coming back, more than happy, to be honest. We're a little bit stuck there now. I can live without him, but it's nice to see him doing well. He did a, a really good job for us. But you mentioned the injury prone stuff there. Yes, he had that a little bit with us as well. Um, outside of Sanderson, who's been your, your stand-up players this year and who are the players that were, we should be keeping an eye on on Saturday or, or likely to cause us damage if you prefer? Well, I think John Ruddy is probably my player of the season, our goalkeeper, um, former Premier League goalkeeper for how many years for Norwich. Um, you know, really, and also Wolves as well. He was a Premier League goalkeeper there as well. He's just got bags of experience, really, and he's really been a solid player for us this season. He's been what's really kept us together for a long period of time this season. Uh, he's kept so many clean sheets as well, saved so many penalties and everything. It's just, he really, he, you can see the professional in his uh, professionalism in him as well he's just like he gets in does the job goes home you know that's the type of man that he is really and he's he, he is going to be difficult to beat on Saturday I think I feel like you you can score goals against him he's not invincible but of course I feel like he is very solid so if if, if we were to lose on Saturday I don't think we'd lose by more than one goal to be honest I feel like it will be tight it will be a, an entertaining game I'm sure of it um but I think John Ruddy is going to be the key decider in keeping us in the game because there's been other other areas of the pitch. You know, we've got players, like I said, George Hall and Alfie Chang, they've been impressing us of late. But they are still younger players and some of the older players don't still quite have it anymore. Players like Deeney, who in his prime was an absolutely top Premier League striker, but doesn't have that anymore. And obviously he's injured as well for the game on Saturday. Um, but... He, a lot of the other players in the team probably don't have that cutting edge. They work hard and they're good and they're good lads and everything. But I think when it comes to like John Ruddy, he's still got that top edge to him. Really, he's still got that top quality to him. He still could be, I reckon. I, I reckon if Norwich had him for this season, I reckon they'd be further up the Premier League, uh, further up the Championship than they are actually, because he he still strikes me as one of those players who can still be at the top of his game. Really, he's he's quality. He's been great for us this season. We actually linked him, I think, at the start of the season when Alex Neal was here and doesn't really fit our model because of his age profile, but um, I don't think anyone necessarily would have been unhappy with that at the time as what would have been a backup or competition for, for Anthony Patterson, as it is. Anthony Patterson's had a tremendous season, but yeah, it doesn't mm. surprise me to hear that, that he's doing well. Now, I wouldn't be doing the show and the, for our fans just as if I didn't ask. There has been one player linked, I've mentioned his name before, not sadly Jude Bellingham. I think he might be a little mm -hmm. bit out of our reach. Um, but his brother, which is Job, um, 
obviously he's not as good as his brother because I think at the moment there's very few that are in the world. Um, and the potential of that Jude showed from the age of 16, it, I think it was there for all to see and it's no surprise to us, let alone use of, of where he's at at the moment. But it's kind of quieting down a little bit with the job stuff, but you never know. You never know what might happen there. Mike Dodd's connection, the, the Speakman connection and anything can happen in football and things change on a daily basis. He's played a few games for you this term. He's maybe not played as frequently as his brother did when he broke through, but is he a player that has as maybe not as much as potential as Jude obviously doesn't, but what potential does he have? And, and if we were to bring him in, what, what kind of player is he? And, and if we don't, what are Birmingham fans expecting of him over the next few years? He has very similar, he has some, yeah, he, he is very similar to Jude in a lot of ways, actually. He, he carries himself in that similar way. He's very direct. Um, he had a chance um, uh, in that Stoke game towards the end of the game. Um and the ball comes into him and he just takes it on, on the volley. He's like, he's very direct in his thinking. He obviously, he wants to go to goal. He wants to attack. They're both very attacking minded players. Um, but yeah, I feel like with Job, I feel like the hype has probably died down because obviously they are two different people. And in personal belief, I feel like people should, um, I don't know why to probably phrase it, but the, I think Job really should be, have some pressure taken off of him, really, because he's still a young lad. I mean, Jude was a one in a million, really, for the player that he was. And I feel like for most 17-year-old kids, I mean, my brother's 17, and he acts as immature, and he's like as unprofessional as you could possibly be. So, you know, it's how you are as a person and as an age, really. And I'm not saying Job is unprofessional before anybody gets my back about that. But, you know, people should just relax about him. You know, he's he's a good player. Within time, he'll come more into the first team. And he's making some more appearances off the bench, which is good to see. Um, again, with Eustace, I feel like he's learning that on the job. It's becoming um, more apparent that he can, you know, when to do the right substitutions and how to do these things around the team, keep everybody happy and everything. And he's got a lot of young players to consider as well, not just Job, you know, players like I've said Alfie Chang and George all three times now, actually. Um, but along that line, again, it's like those players, we've got a lot of them. So he needs to really consider that. And I think he's done well. And again, with Job, you know, people can relax about him. I feel like in the next few years, he will become more of a first-team player. And if he was to move on, it's probably good for his career as well because if I was in his position right now and I was offered by Sunderland a proper offer, I don't know how much he'd be going for. But I feel like if you were to look down the line and consider who's probably got the more stable future out of the two clubs, I wouldn't be surprised if he chose Sunderland, to be honest, really, because like like me... You only have to look at us in the last six seasons, really, to see that we are just going nowhere, really. But Sunderland, even if they have gone down, they will come back up and they'll go forward again. So, I mean, it's it's something to consider for Joe, really. But, of course, he'll make the decisions for himself. And, um, yeah, he will become a good player. How good he will be, I'm not too sure. But he definitely will be championship quality in the future. I'm absolutely certain of that. He won't be one of those players who falls away. He's, he's too... He's too smart for that. He's he's too he's too intelligent, really. He's a quality player, and he, he will become a championship quality player in the future. And if he's half the player his brother is, then he's he's not too bad. Mm. Um, which is kind of my thoughts on it. So yeah, and fingers crossed that one for us does work mm-hmm. out at some point. Um, you touch on something there. Obviously, I always find it quite interesting what people have made of of our season, and I think. You know, speaking to fans, obviously, I had a Birmingham fan earlier in the season and, and asked about their opinion on us. And, and halfway through the season, you think, well, something have done well, momentum carries you so far. But we've got into, obviously, April. We're down to the last five games of the season. We're four points off the playoffs. We're 10th. We've had our striker injured all season, not played with one for the majority of the season because of that. And add in about another 50 million injuries on top. But we've coped. And I know that the fans have spoke to you over the season. You know, week on week have gone. I wasn't surprised at how well you've done. Um, I wouldn't be surprised seeing the playoffs and X, Y, and Z. And, and it's felt very sort of refreshing after four years of League One fans telling me that well, I've got to remember I'm in League One, if I'm completely yeah. honest <laughs> with you. Um, I could, you know, remind myself every single week, unfortunately. But from an outside looking in, what have you made of, of Sunderland's return to the Championship? Has it been what you expected? Have you done better than expected? Or um, just thoughts on it, really? Yeah, well, it's definitely better than I expected. I expected us, I expected them to be around the same position that we were, really in the season but I mean it must have been incredibly exciting with some of the games this season I mean I was watching the um, Middlesbrough game on the telly a couple of weeks or months ago it was and that was fantastic the atmosphere is great and obviously the stadium lies is one of the best grounds in England particularly with the atmosphere as well it's an amazing place as well to be up in the northeast as well um, 
But yeah, I don't know. It's I think with Sunderland looking ahead, really, because obviously you've had a really exciting season. It's been better than I, I imagine. It's been better, but more better than you, really, as you can expect as well. But I don't know. You say you've got five games left. You're three points off the playoffs, is it? I can't. Four points, yeah. Um, I would see these last five games as sort of like knockout football. If you can do it, then it's 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 great because you're in the position again. But there again, if you do make the playoffs and you've absolutely shattered yourself to get there then you're probably going to lose in the playoffs but really like with five games left potentially seven with the optional eight as well again into the playoffs as well you know it's I, I, I wouldn't be against really just going for it in these last few games just try and attack as much as you can try and get as many goals as you can and it's a great end to the season then rather than you know showing up shop and thinking that oh, we're not, we've just missed out this year so we'll go next year I feel like you know, go for it because it might not come next year. It might you might be in the position we're in next season. So, give it a crack. See if it if it happens as well. Then anything is possible in the playoffs as well. That's even more of knockout football because it literally is. Then isn't it? It's, it's how exciting it can be. I can. I'm completely echoing what you said there. Um, I was kind of said you can't choose when you go up. So I don't think we're gonna. I don't think we're going to. I think it's a bit. It's a big ask. But you know, you're four points off. You what you got to lose. We're not going down. Mm. We'll be all right. Um. One question I always ask before I get your predictions for the, the game of the weekend is, I think I know the answer to this based on the way that we played and the way that he played in particular in that game on Friday night. But obviously we won 2-1 in um, the reverse fixture. It was one of our, our better performances that season. I think we just got Ella Sims back. It was one of the, the one of the rare games this season we actually had a centre-forward and the centre-forward scored. Hmm. Um, there was one particular player that was outstanding that night, but I'll ask you nonetheless. Um, which players impressed you most when, when we were up at uh, St Andrews? Yeah, I mean, Ellison's gone back to Everton now, hasn't he? Since yeah, then, sadly, mm. unfortunately, I mean that's that's a bit of a miss. Um, but yeah, Jello uh, and obviously Jack Clark and everything. I think going forward is the real threat. Really, that's the excitement that the Sunderland team have bought this season. I mean, that goal against Reading that was yeah, it was you. That goal this season it was fantastic. It was amazing to watch, and you know, I feel like that's when you get a good bounce really, and when you've got something to work towards after you've been down in the dumps for so long it just must feel fantastic when you're finally back it just you're going for it and you're playing attacking football exciting football and if you're going to take that against us on the weekends then chances are you're probably going to win as well because we cannot defend against really high fast-paced intense players uh, teams we can counter-attack we've done that very well this season a lot of our goals this season that come from counter-attacks but I think like we played Burnley just after uh, the World Cup, and they just they were too quick for us, too sharp, moved the ball around too quickly. So I feel like really those type of players like Jallo and Jack Clark and those attacking players they can really shine in that game against us if they really do just go for it because they can they can cause trouble for us and I don't think we can handle that really. That's actually made me feel really confident. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> so I see it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good, though. Um, predictions, as always, I'm terrible with them. Uh, I got one right the other week. I randomly predicted a 0-0 draw against Burnley, and I'm going to revel in that probably next year until I get the next one right. But I haven't had any right since, and obviously I didn't guess 4-4 against Hull because, well, who is? And neither of us had strikers in the game, and that was just... One in a million, but I, I do feel quite confident going into the game um, on Saturday. I do feel like it'll be a, a game where we win because, of course, Sunderland want to give you a bit of hope. We'll like, probably edge closer at the playoffs as, as we get closer to the scene and then duff it up against somebody like, I don't know, Preston on the final mm. day of the season because, you know, things can't be completely perfect as, you know, sometimes the performances on the pitch have felt this season. I've been content and happy, but I'm going to be confident this week and I... I quite fancy a 2 0, which means it won't be 2 0, but I still feel confident that we will win. But um, how are you viewing the game heading into the, the, the match on Saturday, mate? Uh, I think it'll be a draw. I think it'll be a 1 1. Uh, I think you'll take the lead just because of the way that we usually start games. I mean, the last few games, we've not started them well. I mean, we were 1 0 down against Reading um, inside the opening 10 minutes of the game. I think it was Andy Carroll scored four players. Um, I think that's the type of thing we can expect in the very early on I think we might concede early on I'm expecting a lot of scrapping in and around the box really because that's been a, a key thing this season that I don't think many people have picked up on really is that when the ball's bouncing around our area we just don't clear it and 
we have conceded goals like that this season. It's just like, come on, just get rid of the ball. Like we're creating we're creating problems for ourselves. And I, I feel like we will get back into the game. It's not going to be a, the best football we've ever played before. I mean, like the best football we've played this season came at home against West Brom when we won two 0 and it's just that West Brom didn't turn up really. So I feel like we'll we'll get an equaliser towards. I think both goals will come in the first half, but I don't know. It's not going to be the most. Uh, it's not going to be a great show display on anything. But um, yeah, I'm thinking one one. I think I'd be quite happy with the one one as well because it's a tough tough place to go to at the best of times and. Obviously, with you still being in the playoff charge as well, then you've probably got more to play for than us as well. So um, I'm thinking of 1-1. One, one. I don't think I'd take a 1-1, one, one, so I'm going to stick with my 2-0 um, yeah. and keep my fingers crossed. But, but Tommy, before I let you go, um, obviously you've got your own podcast, you do your own podcast, you do your own stuff. Where can we find anything? If we Obviously, if we win, it's always nice to listen to the opposition. I'm not going to lie with that. So if we were to do that, where could we find you? Uh, you can find us at Blues Focus TV on YouTube. And also on Twitter and Instagram as well. Uh, we I do a regular match day vlog. Unfortunately, I won't be there um, on Saturday. Um, we're a bit skinned at the moment. I can't lie. Um, we all and are. also, we all are. <laughs> <laughs> trust me, man. It's uh, it's very expensive <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a, it's a fair journey as well. I mean, I live in the north. I live in um, near Manchester way, but it's still a fair journey towards Sunderland as well. Um, but I might be doing um, a live watch along. So if any of you can't make the game and you fancy tuning in, so be sure to come join us. Uh, we also do a regular podcast. We've got loads of stuff on the YouTube channel. That's probably the main place to go and find us. But uh, yeah, come over and uh, give us a subscribe and uh, be sure to interact with us as well because we're very active in the comment section and everything too. Don't send any abuse. Um, <laughs> Tommy, thanks for joining me, mate. I really appreciate it. No luck on Saturday, which is standard, as I'm sure I'll expect back from you. But thanks for joining me, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that.